Lu Yu may have recommended mountain spring water for making tea. But in America, we seem to prefer the water from Boston Harbor. Well, it's a bit more nuanced than that. Today, we're having tea with Abigail Adams. Hi, I'm Jen from Tea Leaves in Tweed, and welcome to another historical tea video. Today, I wanted to take a look at the tea in the late 18th century uh, United States of America, the colonial, revolutionary, and the early period of the existence of the United States, because most of the narrative that we hear talks about the Boston Tea Party and how Americans boycotted British tea, they boycotted tea, and that's why Americans don't drink tea. But in reality, even some of our founding fathers were still quite fond of tea. So Abigail and her husband, John Adams, who was one of our early presidents, kept really extensive letters between the two of them, and many of those letters survive, and we can look at them, and one of the things they talked about was tea. And while John often writes to Abigail about sending her a special type of tea, for example, he writes in one letter in, I believe, 1776, in September of 1776, that he's going to send her some wonderful new green tea he's had. In general, Abigail seems to have drunk buoy tea, which was the standard cheap tea of the 18th century in Britain and the British owned territories. And she talks about buoy tea as a household staple in her long lists bemoaning the cost of her household staples like fabric, sugar, flour, and buoy tea. So first, as you may recall from my Jane Austen video, the 18th and early 19th century method of making tea in the West was particular and took a bit of a long time. So I think first I'm going to get the tea started and then we'll chat a little bit about the sources that talk about Abigail Adams' tea habits. So let's brew. So as I mentioned, tea in the British colonies was usually buhi tea, which is actually tea from Wuyi in China. And this is the little Chaigan tea from Valley Brook Tea which is a Wuyi black tea that is actually very, very similar to the original tea that would have been exported to the British Empire and the colonists. So I thought I would use this. This is five grams of tea, which according to a cookbook from the year 1800, would make enough tea to serve two people. And since a teacup is considered to be about four fluid ounces, I have here a little eight ounce teapot that I'm going to make my tea in. So first we'll take a look at these leaves. These are actually quite large leaves, but they're kind of spindly and uh, spiny. So these are probably a much finer quality than what American colonists would have gotten. But since Abigail Adams was from a relatively well-off family, it's likely she would have been able to get the best available. So here I have some boiling water. And if you recall, the method for making tea in the 18th and early 19th centuries was to fill your teapot about half full and let it tincture for 10 or 15 minutes. So we're going to let that tincture or steep and chat a little bit about the Adamses and their relationship with tea. So of course, no discussion about tea in the United States is complete without discussing the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Tea Party was of course the night in 1773 when a group of local colonists in Boston attacked a ship bearing tea from England and dumped it into Boston Harbor, ruining the tea shipment, supposedly in protest of the King's, King George's tax on tea, which raised the price of tea. It's interesting because Abigail Adams in her letters does talk a bit about the raised prices of tea in some of her letters. Many of her letters are simply 
lists of bills that need to be paid and lists of what things cost and her concerns about whether or not they might run out of money while John was away. So we get a good sense of what she considered staples for a household, as well as a sense of how events at the time might have been affecting the cost of those staples. Now, there is some different opinion about the actual motivation behind the Boston Tea Party, and I will link a podcast from Malcolm Gladwell about how the colonists who took part in the Boston Tea Party may have actually been tea smugglers. So I'll link that below for another opinion. However, the sense was that patriotic American colonists didn't drink tea. And of course, this is not true. In fact, tea was very popular in late 18th century Boston. And in fact, there's a contemporary source that says that Boston Bostoners drank copious amounts of tea. Their breakfasts were many, many cups of tea along with buttered bread. And they had the same copious numbers of cups of tea in the afternoon just without the bread. So Bostoners did not stop drinking tea. And even the founding fathers did not stop drinking tea. As late as 1779, Abigail Adams is writing to her husband about buying Boohee tea and about Boohee tea as being a staple of the household. As I said in 1776, which was three years after the Boston Tea Party almost, John Adams is writing about having some interesting new green tea sent to his wife. It actually seems like the Adamses may have been tea aficionados um, who enjoyed trying new and interesting teas, whether that was because it was a luxury of the time and it was a bit of a status symbol or because they were genuinely tea nerds, the same way I noticed about Baisao, the old tea seller in Japan, uh, which is really interesting to see primary sources about people writing about tea, particularly at a time when for someone who would go on to become one of the founding fathers of the United States of America, this would be a bit of a taboo thing to be into. So, Abigail Adams definitely continued to drink tea. John Adams continued to drink tea. He interacted with merchants who talked about how they couldn't boycott British goods because they hosted British dignitaries. And into the mid 19th century, the United States of America relied on diplomatic ties with Britain despite having won our revolution. It's actually one of the reasons for the War of 1812. So it's really interesting to see how the interplay between Britain and the US and the US and tea, which was seen as a British commodity, was so much more nuanced than the Americans dumped all their tea in Boston Harbor and haven't touched a drop since, which we all know is not true. So now I think it's about time to check on our little pot of tea see how it's doing and we can try a cup of tea inspired by Abigail Adams staple buoy tea. So now our tea has been steeping for about 10 minutes with half the water and since it likely has cooled off a bit you would now dilute it with a little more hot water which warms the tea and brings it to an appropriate strength and then you can serve it. Now, another peculiarity of tea in the late 18th and early 19th century in the West is that tea was often drunk out of tea dishes, which were cups and saucers that did not have a handle. So coffee cups originally had a handle and chocolate cups had a handle, but tea cups originally did not have a handle, likely modeled after tea cups from China, which is what this is. This is a tea cup I got from Valley Brook, which is a beautiful, handle this teacup and saucer, likely a bit smaller than they would have drunk from in colonial America. However, it gives the general sense of how the teacups were very lightly adapted from the original Chinese teacups that would have been served to travelers and buyers from the West. So I'm going to warm my cup with a little bit of hot water.
And of course, the colonists would drink their tea with milk if they liked it that way. Um, not everybody preferred their tea with milk. So I am not drinking my tea with milk today. It's simply only because we are rather rationing milk and saving most of our milk for our toddler these days while we are only going to the store every two weeks. Pick up my saucer. Mm. I love this style of tea. This is very similar to what I've tried before as an unsmoked lapsang. It's from the same region as Jinjunmei. Uh, this wooey black tea has a very particular flavor to it. It's a little sweet, it's a little tart, it's a little kind of funky. I sometimes get a sense that it has notes of pumpernickel or rye bread. And it's just a very lovely little tea. And it is hopefully something that can help us connect with our tea history because this would have been the same terroir that the tea for the original colonies would have come from. So I hope you enjoyed this historical tea session. This was Tea with Abigail Adams. Of course, I'll link all my materials below that I used in my research. And I hope you'll, you'll join me again sometime. Please like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. And I'll see you again sometime. Bye.